Welcome once again to one of our live streams, Common Labs. And we're, we are going to call this part one because there's no way I can cover all these evaluations. But Common Labs or Common Laboratory Evaluation Part One. We're going to focus a little bit more on liver function, kidney function, blood sugar issues and evaluations. And a little later on, we're going to do maybe more of the red blood cell, right, white blood cell, platelet counts, and so on. So common laboratory evaluations, not necessarily from a disease standpoint. That's for your physician to diagnose. We will mention some things uh, that are disease state oriented, but we want to focus this on um, not just an evaluation, but what they mean, what their relevance is from a functional health, from a functional standpoint. Common labs, part one, let's talk about it. Let's talk about ALTs, AST, GGTP, liver function, liver enzymes. Now, can you release these enzymes uh, from your musculature? Yes, you can. So the typical labs will say, well, these are anywhere from 0 to 50, or, and maybe here, you know, 0 to 40, or 10 to 45. So there's a big wide range. And we will tell you that ideally, these two guys should be somewhere, and I don't want to get into the specifics of what the units are. Let's just keep this very simple. So on a lab, when you look at a lab sheet, uh, amino L transferase, amino S transferases, um, wh what lab? We want it to be in the low 20s or somewhere in the 20 range. GGTP, and I'll explain, we want it to be maybe somewhere between 10 and 20 on a lab range. So what does this mean? Well, typically, if these numbers are very high, 50, 60, 70, 80, there's liver distress. There could be some muscular breakdown. There could be some things going on with the musculature that have been broken. Or maybe you're excessively exercising or heavy exercise. These even can be cardiac markers, indirect um, cardiac markers for heart attacks, myocardial infarcts, today functional. If liver enzymes are elevated, that's showing some level of liver distress, possibly fatty liver, fatty infiltrates. Um, I'm exposed to chemicals and toxins. Maybe I'm carrying some type of viral load. So these two guys are very, very key markers for health because it's telling you um, what's happening from a liver distress standpoint. So when we look at these on your labs, very important to know what these guys are, what they mean. Too low is indirectly a marker of, in my mind, sluggish liver function. Too high, fatty liver, liver that's on overload, things that are a, a, a very bad leaky gut situation where the liver is being traumatized by chemicals, foodstuffs, toxemia, that's an issue. GGTP is also part of the liver enzyme cascade, but focuses a little bit more on what we would call the biliary tree or the gallbladder. So you have more. So when this number is elevated, often that is more specific to gallbladder dysfunction. So <clears throat> I'm not going to get into what you do in these scenarios, and that's more when we work with you one-on-one. -on -one. But when you see these numbers, what does it mean to you? <clears throat> or once you have a lab evaluation, what does it mean? All right. Number two, let's talk about an albumin level. Let's talk about protein first, serum protein. Typically, the laboratory value is six to eight. We tell you we want you somewhere around 7, maybe 7.2, more midpoint. Why? Because if my serum proteins are way high, 8, there's something wrong. You either are breaking down, you're either catabolic, or you are um, maybe possibly dealing with someone that has anorexia or some major, major issues here, or they're consuming a ton of protein. <clears throat> if their numbers are very low, down around 6.0, they possibly do not consume enough protein, or they are not digesting it well. So when we read this, and you've got a chronic number of 6.1, 6.2, we're going to be asking you about digestive competence. Are you digesting your foods well? Um, do you eat enough protein? We'll want to do an evaluation of what you consume. So low serum protein is a problem. Very high serum protein is a problem. We want you midpoint, okay? So serum protein, critical. Following on this, we always look at serum albumin levels. So when you get blood work done and you work with us, we're going to know what your albumin levels are. Typically, this range runs the typical laboratory diagnoses for distress or disease. It's three and a half to five. Once again, a hugely wide range. 
We want you somewhere in that 4.2 and above category, not over 5, but 4.2, 4.3, 4.1, 4.4. Why? This is showing that we have good, adequate functioning from protein. Protein's getting its job done. We're breaking it down. We're converting it. And albumin is a marker of health, indirectly a very significant marker of health. You can follow this often if someone's albumin levels are dropping dramatically, 3, 5, 3, 3, 3, 2. This body is a body under significant distress. It could be significant, who knows, rheumatoid arthritis. It could be some degenerative joint or degenerative disease that's major. It could be chemotherapy. It could be someone that possibly has cancer, God forbid. So again, it's not our role to diagnose that, but you, when you follow these albumin levels, this gives you an idea. It's a marker of health, what is going on, and often we can begin to support you and replete you to help build those albumin markers or recognize that they're beginning to drop and your body is suffering, not just from a disease standpoint, but from a functional health standpoint as well, all right? So we got liver enzymes the basics, AST, ALT, GGTP, serum protein, serum albumins, very, very critical markers of health. Kind of my eyes, when I'm evaluating labs, my eyes are going really to those areas probably first. In part two, we'll talk about, I also I really want to know what your neutrophils, your lymphocytes are. That tells us a lot about your immune system, what is happening. That's in another section. I can't cover that all today. Platelet counts. Tells us a lot as well. Let's jump over now to, um, I'm not going to do cholesterol in this evaluation. Let's go over to blood sugars. Blood sugars, so blood glucose and um, A1C. So what does this mean? So I get blood work done and, and I go to my doctor, my medical doctor, and he says, hey, your blood sugar was elevated, or she says. And so they, you know, your blood sugar was 115. So what's the typical range? Well, the typical accepted ranges are somewhere, again, I'm not going to get into the, the, you know, the units here, 70 to 100, 70 to 110, um, so if, you're, if you come back with a fasting blood sugar of 115, that's showing you possibly that you're in a pre-diabetic state. Your physician is going to start talking to you about, hey, you, you know what, Ralph, uh, uh, Sue, you, you look like you're moving towards diabetes here. What our goal is is often to catch you before you get there, and I'll prove that to you, and I'll show that to you. But blood sugars are very, very critical markers, obviously, of how you're handling what you consume. So I'm either consuming too much, in the way of carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates, too much sugar, too much process, too much white, uh, that, that's triggering my rise. And now a way to, and you've had this marker forever now, this has been around for I don't know how many years, but HbA1c more specifically, it's glycosylated hemoglobin, meaning that this is an average of your blood sugar or blood glucose over approximately a 90-day period. It gives you an average. So now you can not only get a fasting blood glucose, which is very important to know what it is on a fasting state, but then we've got to know, <coughs> excuse me, what it is over the period of a couple of months. So what's happening postprandial after your meals? What's happening on a fasting state? What ha what's happening on a 24-hour block over the span of weeks? into months. So if your A1C is 7.0, um, you've got some significant problems. You're in a more of a diabetic state. If you're running 5.6 for an A1C, that's a nice number. You're running 8, you have some serious problems going on. Your, your average blood sugar is running extremely high. Above this, it's very bad. That's all I can say to you. But all right, blood glucose. Say, so, well, I already knew that. You know, my blood sugar, you know, I know my doc, and it was 105, and they told me to keep an eye on it and so on. And my A1C was okay, or actually some folks, their fasting blood sugars run a little high, but their A1C is okay. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but here's what I want to talk to you about as well here quickly. Fasting insulins, which we believe are critically important to know, fasting insulin, and as well, a fasting-free insulin, because this is a precursor 
to telling folks if they're moving towards diabetes. So as opposed to waiting for the end result, what is my A1C or what is my fasting blood sugar or fasting glucose, what about knowing, uh, not ahead of time, but early on what your fasting insulin levels are and this tells us whether or not we are in an insulin resistant state and if I'm in an insulin resistant state that will then eventually potentially lead me to rises in fasting blood sugars, rises in average blood sugars, A1Cs over time. So knowing what a fasting and free insulin are, are critical to human health and physiology. This tells us where we're going. This value tells us where we're going. You say, wait a minute, is that, I always get that. No, most, you probably don't. You get a fasting blood sugar, you typically don't get a fast. This has to really be requested. Most physicians don't see the value of that. I think we're really missing the boat. You should know what that is because that is a predictor of where your blood glucose will eventually go to. It'll tell you if you're moving in that metabolic syndrome state, insulin resistant state, which is at the point then we can do something for you. I, I can put you on ultra glucose control. I can put you on Omega Advanced. I can put you on Core IR. I can get you moving and exercising so that these A1Cs don't rise, fasting blood sugars don't rise, and then you wind up on medications, right? Can you change that process even once they've elevated? You most surely and most certainly can. We work with folks when they're engaged with us on a regular basis, and you most certainly can change those numbers. Other areas I want to talk to you about today, um, depending upon time, um, I want to talk about uric acid. This is one that's overlooked a great deal. Uric acid ranges, and I wrote down here, anywhere from 2.4, quote, to 7, considered normal. Um, high uric acid usually leads to gout. So let's just state that immediately. So most physicians only worry about uric acid in the presence of pain, pain in the extremities, redness of joints. I, I can't even put my socks on. I can't even put a shoe on. I'm in pain, doc. What am I going to do? Well, we've got to get blood work on. We're going to test your uric acid. You might have the gout, gouty arthritis. And that's all well and good. What I want to tell you is why you need to have this marker done on a regular basis because uric acid, when it's elevated, even if it's not to the point where you are developing gout, but it's an inflammatory marker. It's in response to inflammation. It is a metabolic problem. It's shown us that we're eating too many of the wrong types of foods. We are not processing well. We're not metabolizing these components well. We eat too much in the way of whites and refines and processed. And often now these uric acid levels start to rise. Heavy metals can be involved here too. They start to rise, maybe not to the point where you get gouty arthritis in your joints. But even more importantly, when uric acid remains elevated, let's just say six and above, not to the point, slightly above, to the point where you have gout pain, so it's not a physical manifestation, but what it's beginning to do is it increases the risk for hypertension, high blood pressure. Yes, elevated uric acid can do that. It is increasing the risk for kidney disease and kidney decline. So kidney function goes down in the presence of elevated uric acid. Your stroke risk goes up, most literature showing by about 40% in the presence of elevated uric acid levels. And your inflammatory components of this are so huge, and that puts you at a higher risk for cardiovascular disease when uric acid is elevated. So why do we want to get this number? Just to define, well, I never had gout. That's fine. Praise God. But if these numbers run 6, 5.8, 6.4, and you've been up there pretty regularly for a long period of time, the problem with that is, is that you are increasing your risk for kidney problems, hypertension, increasing stroke risk, some of the literature even showing degenerative um, types of neurodegenerative problems, so it, you, you, because it's, it's an inflammatory component. 
and you raise your heart risk, your cardiovascular risk. So just taking a look at uric acid tells you a lot about your health. So we've covered some key areas. Um, the last one I would like to cover on part one, and that's why I said it, there's going to have to be a part two. But as Josiah cleanly reminded me, we have to make sure we do the part two, and we will. The other area is BUN levels, blood urea nitrogen. BUN um, can rise. If it's high, that's a, that, that's a problem. It's showing some type of kidney dysfunction, even liver, but more kidney. Um, and then the, 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 the issue here, though, is if it's high, does that just mean you have kidney disease or is it something simple as dehydration? Often it's dehydration. The other area is I'm consuming way too much protein. Or I could have dysbiosis. So I could have elevated blood urea nitrogen levels, and you go to the, to the doctor, and he gets, he says, oh, you have elevated BUN. And you're like, oh, what? <laughs> what is that? Well, I have blood urea nitrogen. Well, nitrogen is released from excessive protein breakdown. So I'm, maybe you're on a high-protein diet that's creating a problem. Maybe you're on a, not on a high-protein diet, but you've got a lot of imbalance of good bacteria in your gut, and you're releasing a lot of nitrogenous waste Blood urea nitrogen levels are rising, okay? That's a problem. I mean, that's a problem. That's showing you've got imbalance in the gut. You're putting stress on the kidneys. So, all right, so dysbiosis. You can be putrefying. That's an indication sometimes of putrefication of foods in the intestinal tract and obviously dehydration. Good numbers somewhere between 10 and 16 on a BUN. So you go to your physician, you get a BUN level. The typical range, the medical range, don't hold me to this, but runs somewhere in this neighborhood, which as you can see is ridiculous to be acceptable at those ranges when it should be down in this tight range. If it's real high, you, you need to be evaluated for kidney disease. See a physician. If it's high and they've evaluated this, that there's nothing wrong with your kidneys, then we need to talk about what's going on in your gut. We need to talk about how you're breaking down your proteins, how much you're consuming. There's other factors. Are you in a chronic state of dehydration, you don't drink enough fluids. If it's too low, if, you're, if your numbers are running six and five and seven, that's often a sign of poor hydrochloric acid production in the gut, poor digestive competence. I'm not breaking down and assimilating my proteins well. So very low tells us something about functional status, functional health. Very high tells us either disease or functional imbalances in the gut excessive protein, or I'm, I'm, I've got dysbiosis. I've got an imbalance, and I'm producing a lot of nitrogenous waste. All right, we've covered blood urea nitrogen, A1Cs, the average blood sugar, fasting blood sugars, fasting and free insulins. We've covered liver function. That's part one. Part two is coming. Part two, we'll talk about maybe a little bit more in the way of minerals, magnesium, potassium, some functional areas of what that really tells us, and also maybe a little bit over on the blood cell count. I'm not going to go through every parameter. This would be ours. But the biggies of what you want to look at, RDWs, lymphocytes, neutrophils, what does that really, a basophils, I don't even know what you're talking about. No, when you get the blood work, and then if something pops up, and your doc says, oh, don't worry about that, and you do an evaluation with us, we can help you understand why your basophils might be elevated, what they really mean. What are monocytes? Geez, my monocytes and eosinophils are always really high. What does that mean? My doc tells me it's nothing. Well, it could be a sign of allergies. It could be a sign of some chronic viral things. It could be a sign of enlarged prostate in men. It's a sign of a lot of different things. Thank you for joining us on Common Laboratory Evaluations, Part 1, Part 2 to Come. See you next time. Thanks for joining us.